Hello, Brian King here. One of my inner circle members asked me, how is it I learned to love myself and love others when I didn't experience love as a child? And to be clear, it's not that I didn't experience any love as a child, it's that I didn't, ex I didn't feel loved in my own family. Because in my house, there was a lot of anger. There was a lot of yelling. There was a lot of corporal punishment. There was a lot of really cruel humor as a way of finding, you know, funniness or laughter in anything. A lot of insulting, a lot of really mean teasing. And I don't remember there being a lot of happiness. You know, there was always conflict. And I was the butt of some of the most mean jokes. I was teased, I was hit, I was excluded, and fortunately, a lot of that was isolated to the family. There was a lot of bullying at school, but also there were these little oases of wonderful human beings, including my best friend, Matt, when I was growing up. He was a, a boy that lived a couple blocks over, and there was a lot of drug addiction in his family. And he was the youngest brother. He was a couple years younger than me. And he also felt like he didn't fit in his own family. And he also wanted to be seen. And he didn't want to be caught up in what was happening in his own family. And I would say he and I were best buds for probably close to 10 years. We spent almost every day together. And we didn't ask a lot from one another, just each other's time and attention. And we shared our dreams about the future. We talked about everything young guys talk about. We talked about girls and and how we both wanted to be Bruce Lee and all kinds of other things like that. And I don't know his experience in school, but I know that there were occasionally teachers that would reach out to me and want to help. And they didn't seem to want anything else in return. They just wanted to help and see me grow, which brings me to an important point. What is love to you? And when people think of love, they tend to think of it in terms of romantic love comes to mind, or the unconditional love that a parent might show for a child. But one definition of love I came across, probably somewhere in the 90s, that really has stuck with me over the years is one I want to reference now. And it's by a, an author named M. Scott Peck, who unfortunately he passed away many years ago. But he wrote a book called The Road Less Traveled. And his definition of love is that love is the will to extend one's self for the purpose of nurturing one's own or another's spiritual growth. That's how he defines love. So basically, you are committed to your own growth. That's love of self. And you are committed to someone else's growth. That's love of someone else. And if you look at it that way, love takes on a different meaning and a different dimension. And one thing that I have really made a point of through my entire life, maybe for different reasons as time has gone on, is being committed to my own growth, being better. Now, the people pleaser side of us wants to be better so people will like us. And of course, that is a losing proposition because for people that can't be satisfied, nothing is ever good enough. And if you're trying to be something somebody else wants, yeah, maybe you'll make them happy, but you're continually chasing their approval and you're never making yourself happy because it's not for you, it's for them and your needs are going unmet, okay? So loving yourself means focusing on what you need, not at the expense of everyone else's needs, but what do you need ideally to be your best self so that you can show up as your best self in order to help other people grow. So even though I didn't feel like my growth was supported necessarily at home, with the exception of my mother on occasion, I want to give her credit where it's due, she took me to acting classes. I was really big into pantomime when I was younger. I, she let me try out for school for plays, that many of which I got to act in, and I really enjoyed that. So she tried her best to, to nurture my creative spirit. 
when it came to corralling a bunch of ADHD and Asperger boys, she did her best, but there's only so much you can do when you have ADHD yourself as a woman in the 70s and 80s, and there's no one there to support you and guide you on how to handle this brood of dysregulated kids. So, again, there's only so much you can do. So she loved as best she could through that melee of chaos. So these people entering my life in and out gave me some insight or gave me the hope that there were more people out there that were willing to help me grow, that saw that I was worthy of supporting. And they were mostly teachers or parents of peers that maybe I was acquaintances with. I remember that there was a kid in a junior high. I was kind of acquaintances with him. And I went home with him one day after school and we were just kind of shooting the breeze. I was shy, I didn't talk much. And his dad was home. He started asking me questions about stuff. And I think it kind of came up that I felt a little pushed around at school. Turns out his dad was a former boxer in the military. Guess what his dad did? Took me over to the heavy bag and gave me a few pointers on how to throw a punch. He didn't have to do that. He could have just said, well, you know, keep your head down, kid. Try and stay away from those guys. He decided to give me a few pointers. People like that who just take a few moments to see me and say, how can I help you? How can I help you grow? Those are the things that reminded me that there is love out there in the world for me, even if it's not within my own home. But sometimes we can mistakenly think that if it doesn't exist in the home, it doesn't exist anywhere because our expectations are that it must exist in the home. That must be our primary source of connection and attachment. And if we can't get it there, what's the point? Why go on? And don't get me wrong. It's very difficult to trust the world or anyone for that matter. If the people that you rely upon most to keep you safe, blow it. And I can say, I really have not felt safe in any home I've ever been in, including the one I'm in now. And that's not because the people in this house make me feel unsafe. It's because in my home where I was raised, I never felt safe. I always felt there was a threat of some kind of a verbal or emotional abuse. And I'm working on that with my therapist now to deal with that trauma so that I can feel safe because I love myself enough to continue working on my growth journey which includes getting to the bottom of this trauma, working through it so that I can find peace on the other side. That's what self-love looks like, is being committed to your own growth of getting rid of the noise and the muck and the stuff that keeps you afraid, keeps you suffering. And love for others is passing forward what you have learned that can free you from that feeling that you're not good enough. Just being present, holding space for, seeing someone else, not trying to change them, not trying to tell them what they should be doing, but just simply being with them and looking at them and saying, I love you. And that means I'm here to support you in your growth, whatever that looks like. It doesn't have to be you telling them what to do, how to do it, when to do it, and you being in charge and being some kind of drill sergeant. It can simply be patting them on the back, cheering them on, letting them know that you believe in them. Not leaving them alone as they take risks and trying something new and trying to defy the intergenerational trauma that's been going on in their family for decades, if not a century or two. So loving is just being there, showing up. It can also be teaching, being actively involved, holding their hand, letting them put their head on your shoulder while they cry and work through their difficult moments. Love can be bold. It can also be simple and subtle. Somebody in the chat page says, how do you start believing in yourself? Well, it's when you start, when enough people believe in you, Paige. 
and you take the risk to trust them and trust them on little things because the big things can be too risky. There can be too much at stake. And when you put so much on the line and it ends up not going the way you want, the loss can seem almost too much to bear and then taking another risk can almost seem too life-threatening to bother. So my recommendation is baby steps. Only bite off as much as you think you can withstand or work through at the time. And as you become more resourceful and resilient over time, you can take bigger steps. But there's nothing anywhere that says you must take big risks in order to make progress. That's a myth, a misnomer, a misunderstanding, whatever you want to call it. Progress is progress. What matters is that you take off whatever bite you need to in order to feel safe in moving. I take small steps, small bites, because I want to make steady progress. I want to keep moving as opposed to taking a big leap and then thinking, man, that was terrifying. I'm not doing that again for another five years. Holy cow. And then spend the next couple of years talking about how hard that was. I don't want to do that. I would rather have things be smooth, steady, educational, not there be a lot of anxiety or fear or resistance. It doesn't have to be that way. I mean, we live in a very highly competitive society where it's all about no pain, no gain. You got to push yourself. You got to hustle. You got to work through it. And I imagine that's where a lot of that thinking about taking that big leap, that big risk, that's where that comes from. I am much more about pacing, taking yourself, you know, taking yourself slow and steady, like I said. But the bottom line is love is a commitment to your own growth, being patient, realizing that mistakes are basically individual acts of experimentation, where you're trying something out to see what works and what doesn't work as far as moving you forward and helping you grow. It's all an education. It's all about trial and learning. It's not about what makes me look smart versus what makes me look stupid. It's all about following your curiosity so that you find what's going to help you germinate and flower and blossom for the rest of us. And then as you grow and as your ability to love yourself expands, you live from that place, from that energy and it's like the fragrance that comes from a flower when it blossoms. People around you can't help but catch a whiff of that fragrance. And then they want to be closer to you and figure out, man, where does that come from? What allows you to blossom so beautifully? What allows this fragrance to emanate from you? And then you can share with them what you've learned and find out what it is they want for themselves. And then you can support them in their growth journey. That's what love is. It starts by taking little chances on yourself and finding one, maybe two or more people that are willing to give you the time, the space, and the attention to grow into the person that you want to be. So that kind of, in a nutshell, kind of answers that question. It's not really a, an easy question to answer, I think, because I had to reflect on it for about a day to see you know, where there are these moments of epiphany or these sequential steps that I followed. And I really couldn't think of anything that followed that way. It was more just kind of a collection of experiences that kind of, I don't wanna say worked independently of each other, but they kind of coalesced. They worked together in kind of a synergy, like putting a recipe together to make the perfect chili. You know, they were all necessary together. So with that, I want to thank you all for watching. I hope this was helpful. And by all means, share it with other people who can benefit from it. And if you want more information on my inner circle, that's my membership. It's women only, women with neurodiversity or kids with neurodiversity. Just shoot me off a DM and I'll give you all the information you want. In the meantime, this has been Brian. Thanks for being you.